It's no secret that East Asian culture and trends have been booming in the West. There was a whole thing about celebrities getting their BBLs removed and East Asian traits be becoming more desirable. Quite frankly, it's been a growing trend for a while now, but I feel like it's gotten so noticeable that even if you aren't fans of K-pop, anime, K-dramas, doying makeup, Korean skincare, or those four Asian girls that people salivate over, you feel their presence. I don't know about any of those except for anime and K-pop. I've never heard of any and of those other ones. And the Oscar goes to... Parasite. Open the door for me. And I love you, my skin game crew. Woo! Wow! BTS! This month, I'm gonna be swapping my current skincare routine for a 10-step Korean one. Welcome to Korean Skincare 101. This is, it's really interesting how like, you know, I watched a video earlier on like the strategy of Thailand where they, they basically invest extremely heavily in building a ton of Thai restaurants all over the United States and all over like everywhere else in the rest of the world. And they make sure that like, in the contracts of these Thai restaurants, they have to use exclusively, like some of their ingredients has to be things that you can only find in Thailand. And by doing that, they ended up in the long term really bolstering their export economy because now people want to cook Thai food and they can only buy the ingredients specifically for that kind of Thai food that they want to make from Thailand, the stuff that they ate at the restaurants. It's interesting to see the strategies that, that countries, that, that specific ethnic groups have in the United States or just in the West in general, um, when it comes to like making money and stuff like that, notice the patterns and be like, hmm, I wonder how this started. I wonder how it got popular. I wonder why they, they're so qualified to do this. I wonder who's training them. I wonder if there's any sort of legal entities also backing it, also supporting it or things like that, you know? Now, first of all, can we all just cheer about the fact that I finally got an actual does, does this chick edit her own videos? Actual microphone. I know I'm holding it weird, like it's supposed to be standing on something, but I'm just gonna hold it because I couldn't find a place to stand it. Now, because of how popular East Asian culture has become... She's talking about this yet. Yeah, look at the makeup she's wearing, bro. I mean, really, it's only South Korea, Japan, and kind of China. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Nobody cares about, like, Vietnam, Cambodia. Nobody cares about these other countries, bro. I, I would I'd literally hang out with, like, some, uh, like, my Korean friends or whatever, and they'd be like, yeah, bro, fuck Cambodia. Fuck these, like, dirty-ass countries. Fuck the Philippines. I'm like, damn, relax, bro. Y'all look the same. You can't even tell them. I doubt you can tell them apart, bro. They act like they can tell them apart. I doubt it. Asians want to, I swear to God, Asians want to act like they all hate each other. They, they act like they're like super hardcore racist, but like to only other Asians until the karaoke machine comes on. Then they're all best friends. Then they're all buddies for life. A type of non-East Asian has emerged, one that fetishizes, appropriates, or just oddly obsesses over East Asianness. Behold the Korea boos, the weebs, or even worse. I've never heard of Korea boos. The weeaboos. Oh, like, uh, I can't think of words. I can't. I can't watch this, bro. I'm in English right now. This. But as fun as it is to cringe at Ollie London and Russian girls who swear that they're fully Korean, this video idea came to me after wondering what factors led them to fetishization. The obvious answer is colonialism and the East-West dichotomy they pushed onto the world. The exotic oriental caricature painted by European powers. But there's a less obvious and less pleasant factor that I want to consider. Does East Asia and East Asian people fetishize themselves in any way? Oh, that's interesting. But I think it's way more complicated than just than just the images portrayed. I think it's actually like there's 
you really want to go deep, I can pinpoint like 10 different things, like at least 10 different things that, uh, oh, I have this subscriber who's got 100k subs. Okay, yeah, it's recent subscribers. I know this guy, though. But, um, it's Tunde, by the way, if you don't know, Tunde Funny. But, what's it called? I think a lot of it, because the reason why I watch anime and stuff like that, the reason why it resonates with me is because I'm such a fucking loser, just like all the rest of these guys. Just like how... I feel like the, the emergent economics of what Japan went through and why so much anime, particularly the way it does, comes out of it now, is essentially the same thing that's happening in the States, but just like 10, 10 or so years behind, you know? There's certainly no coincidence between how we've only popularized terms that refer to fetishizing Korean or Japanese culture, and Korea and Japan carrying out the most successful culture export plans tar- I think that's also because America really values diversity. Whether they know it, like whether they actually value it or not, they always want a virtue signal and talk about how they value diversity so much. A lot of these Asian co uh, countries and people in Asia like that, they don't value diversity. They're like, nah, keep it in the community. One of us, you know, like, like support us. If, if money is, if a dollar is going to be spent, make sure it's spent in the community so that it keeps cycling through the community. Don't let it leave. Targeted at the West. Rarely do we hear about fetishization of Vietnam, Laos, Philippines, yeah. and other less powerful East Asian countries. A large focus of East Asia. I hear a lot about the Philippines now. I hear a lot about Filipino chicks. I hear a lot about uh, Thai, like girls from Thailand. Um, well, no, nah, Thailand's a mess. Thailand is. The girls over there are like Schrodinger's box, and people go there just to do hella drugs and train MMA and get PEDs off like over the counter, basically. Uh, shit that like people that you saw to will never detect you know because they're not checking for it people go to thailand for like that kind of stuff it's a real mess um and people go to thailand to like find themselves and it's just like it's a giant thailand is is planet earth's whorehouse from what i hear i've been to thailand but i don't remember it being like that Asian activism in the West has also been based on physical characteristics, calling out East Asian fishing, for example, or being proud of East Asian features. Wait a second. There's hella, not even East Asian. What, what happened to all the Southeast Asian countries? Why aren't they like really popping off in the, in the States? There's a lot of things like you would think Singapore would really be up there with like South Korea in terms of like how much it's talked about and how much of its culture is like embedded in the States, right? Or like Malaysia. I've been to both, Singapore and Malaysia. I've been to Singapore multiple times. And it really seems like it should be up there. There's got to be other factors at play. There's got to be other factors at play rather than just whatever people in the West in Europe and stuff like that, whatever they choose to fetishize. There's gotta be other things at play. There is one last controversial question that arises from all this. Can being fetishized ever be desirable or empowering? Desirable, sure. Empowering is a stupid word and people should stop using it until someone can like clearly define it. Because a lot of things people consider empowering, when they define the word empowering, it's not empowering, it's the opposite of empowering. Understandable, but self-fetishization. This thing is like, it's not a one-way street. It's not a, it's not a, you look at what happened, like, bro, Cleopatra came through with a brand new hairstyle that nobody had seen before. In one generation, basically every single female had that hairstyle. Every single statue of females at the time were all with that same hairstyle. Like these, these same females that are like, oh, you're treating us like objects. They treat themselves like objects, bro. They themselves advertise themselves like a damn product. Fetishization refers to the quote, 
The intricate ways in which minority subjectivities are objectified based solely on stereotypes and in ways that deny people their humanity. Then no, because this is way too simple of a minority subjectivities are objectified. What the hell does that even mean? There is a science to this stuff, by the way. You can break it down. You can objectify the subjective in some cases. To say that one is better than the other is, is plain stupid, especially when nowadays people are so concerned about objective reality. Oh, what you're saying is subjective. It doesn't matter. You, can't, you have to be objective in your thinking and all this stuff. And based solely on stereotypes? Bro, only a Sith deals in absolutes. I don't know why you're talking with such... I don't, not her. I'm, I don't know why this definition is talking with such extreme language, such superlative language. Solely on stereotypes. Well, stereotypes aren't even based solely on their stereotypes. So... And this is, this is too, too specific. There's other factors at play here um, in a way that deny people their humanity. That's way too much to unpack. In a way that people could deny their own humanity is another way of looking at it. It could be in a way that people were, people give themselves humanity. It depends on what you mean by humanity. Usually people think of fetishization. If you really actually look at it in that perspective, all culture is dehumanizing. All of it is. Because all of it stems from some sort of a deviation from the natural human condition. It's all dehumanizing. In, in a physical sense. For example, liking East Asian people not for their personhood, but for their monolids or cute baby face. But what's really interesting to be aware of is the fact that this East Asian identity She is from Korea. I don't know. I really can't tell. I can sometimes tell, but it's I, I'm I'm only I'm probably only slightly better than just random guessing. And really, other collective identities such as South Asian or Middle Eastern were born in the West. Identifying as East Asian in an actual East Asian country is actually not that common. My relatives don't think of themselves as- I don't necessarily think it was born in the West. These things couldn't have been born in the West before the time where the world was connected enough for these things to be seen enough by the West. They were born globally. As belonging to this large- You know how many like people in South America, like you know how many like Hispanic people and Latin people um, and, and people in Europe, Germans, and all these people like Watch hella anime. Collective identity called East Asian. They primarily think of themselves as Chinese because of how ethnically homogenous the country is. It is only because Western countries like Canada- Whoa, 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 whoa. China is not eth ethnically homogenous. I mean, there's so many people that you can, you can separate China into like 10 different countries and they'd all be ethnically homogenous. But there's, there's, really there's extremely like diverse Ooh, this is this is i gotta specify this every time i say diverse every time i say the word diverse except for the first time i said it because i was specifically talking in that context every time i say diverse i always mean diversity of thought and of culture and of a way of being and a way of living and things like that decision making collective decision making that's what i mean if i'm talking about diversity of like skin color or whatever i'm gonna specify that there ain't much diversity of skin color in China. Actually, there is, believe it or not. Um, there's really, really light people. There's really, really dark people in China, different places in China. But in terms of culture, it is extremely diverse. Uh, and America have considered... But the thing is, a lot of these people don't even know it's... Even people in China don't even realize how diverse it actually is. Because it's not like they even... Inter there's a billion or so, like billion, four hundred million people in China, bro. Something like that. It's, it's way too big to not be ethnically diverse. Considerable ethnic and racial diversity that led minorities to find solidarity with other similar minorities. Because the countries that make up East Asia are culturally and politically distinct from one another, when you actually grow up in an East Asian country, all these countries that Westerners see as belonging to one same group are pretty distinct to you. This is just one of the many differences between an Pretty distinct. Okay, sure. Also, I want to. I want to. I'm gonna make a prediction. 
China's going to have a huge, huge collapse, whether it be economic or in, in, in their government or in their ability to suppress information from, from their citizens or, or they just get straight up overthrown by their people, you know. They, they have a whole last revolution. Who knows? But I, but I actually think in 20 years, not in 10 years, but sometime in between 10 to 25 years around that time, yeah, things are going to fall apart big time. It's going to be a huge, huge paradigm shift in the country. East Asian person who lives and grew up in an actual East Asian country and a person like me who is Chinese Canadian. Damn it, I fucked up. I see it now, kind of. But that's, you know, hindsight's 2020. I was born in Canada. I grew up in Canada. I've been to China a total of three times in my life. And my Mandarin skills are embarrassing. Mama, Baba, doibuchi. So if East Asians who grew up in the West, like me, don't have a personal immersive understanding of our distinctive culture, norms, politics, and mannerisms, then one of the large factors- That's a dangerous game to be playing though. Oh, our distinctive culture. Don't say that so lightly. If you, if you were born into a, uh, if you were adopted, into a Korean family and their culture is so distinct, right? And you grew up your entire life Korean and they never told you you were Chinese. In fact, let's say they didn't even know. You wanna know what? You'd be making this video and in the video you'd be saying, my distinctive culture as a Korean. In fact, this has happened with parents who have adopted kids, particularly Asians, and they don't know what they are and they think there's one thing when they're actually another thing. And they grow up in that way and then they find out way later on. They find out years and years down the line. And not that's not even to mention how many parents don't find out. Who knows how many of those there are. But yeah, to say that like, uh, oh, I was, I was born into this culture. But, you know, because of the Internet and because of what people told me, I can find the culture that I'm actually that, that my ancestors are from. Regardless of whatever genetic differences it may have, instead of me letting it emerge naturally and finding my own communities and just, you know, if it happens, it happens and I join my own culture. Um, instead of me focusing on, on the way I grew up, I'm going to assign myself to this culture kind of arbitrarily at this point because you don't live in that place anymore. Does that play into feeling East? I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying if you're going to go down this path of saying that these cultures are so distinct, tread lightly. Asian is our physical appearance. Many white passing Asians feel less Asian than Asian passing Asians, even if their connection to their Asian roots are the same. Um, it's a slippery slope and you're slipping. You're slipping big time. First of all, you have to first assess, you have to first create a metric for Asian. You have to create some sort of a measurable, quantifiable thing to determine how Asian someone is or how Asian they feel. And then if you do that, tons of people who are not Asian will, will claim that they feel that way. And they'll satisfy all those requirements no matter what quantifiable metric you set. No matter what it is. They will feel that way and they will logically dismantle your argument no matter what you set as, as whatever metric you have. Because culture is not something that you, you're that you can just prescribe for yourself if you're not involved in. Culture is not passive, it's participatory. It's not something you could just read about in a book and go, oh, this is what I am. This is what Asian culture is. It's, it's not even Asian culture. Asian culture is so goddamn diverse, literally not even from country to country, but from group of people, from groups of families to groups of families. No, nah, this is the culture of my family, bro. This is the culture of the Ali family. Like, that's what it is. People who follow an East Asian makeup style are assumed to be more Asian. I feel more Asian if I followed, like, Korean style makeup. Now, I want to apologize. I feel like... Mm, I guess that bridges the gap. But 
apologize in advance for all of the names I'm going to mispronounce in this video. I am very, very sorry about that. We're just gonna have to go with it and cringe every time I say something wrong. Here's, I don't understand like what people do that. Like if somebody mispronounces my name, my name is Afraz, it's spelled A-F-R-A-A-Z. It's pronounced Afraz. The, the emphasis is on the uh, Afraz. And when people mispronounce my name, a phrase, a phrase, whatever, right? I'm never like, oh my God, you hurt my feelings. I'm like, damn, that's a pretty tough name to spell, huh? A-F-R-A-Z. You don't see that name every day. I'm never offended. I never need people to go like, oh my God, I apologize. And you know what? Let me add a second sentence to it. I am so, so sorry. And it's so cringe. And I also have a rule. Don't apologize for something that you know you're going to do again. Don't apologize for something that you don't have this much control over. Apologize for something that you're genuinely, truly sorry about and, and signify with a, with a second sentence, to, like append another sentence to your apology saying it will never happen again. Otherwise, what, what purpose is your apology? If you punch someone in the face and go, I'm sorry, and then punch someone again, punch them again in the face, no, I'm sorry, and then punch them again. What does the words I'm sorry mean? If, you, if it has, it, it clearly has no meaning then. So if you, if you know you're going to mispronounce names, which everyone will mispronounce names that they don't know, everyone will mispronounce names in places and things like that they've never heard of before. It's a normal human mistake. Why apologize for it? You're going to do it again. There's no point in apologizing. So there's this wonderfully written article by Barry Haft, who talks about how as a South Asian individual who grew up in America, they saw their physical traits as what connected them to their heritage. Quote, I always thought of my body as a canvas for identity. Mm. You want to get into the whole nature versus nurture argument. I think for a part of someone's identity, that's reasonable because genetics play a factor. And what you look like is the culmination of all of the, the genetic decisions made by your ancestors. So yeah, that's totally reasonable. But um, yeah, it's, it's, she's slipping, the slipping black Jimmy. The body hair growing out of my stark brown skin as an ode to my roots. Skin that the sun greets like an old love, glowing. This is so pretentious. This is so pretentious, bro. It's so, like, I, if anybody writes like this about some sort of serious topic, like the, the, the morality of self-fetishization or whatever, or the fetishization of others based on, like, cultural roots and things like that, you're going to have to talk with, like, some, talk like a five-year-old can understand you. Talk with some seriousness, bro. But if you come across as, like, oh, I'm trying to be some fucking poet. You know, nah, dude, I'm not taking you seriously. You're clearly doing this for attention. Bronze with gentle strokes of light and wrapping around almond shaped eyes in the darkest of browns. Eyes under brows stubborn and erratic when ungroomed like the mind behind them. I look at my body and see an inseverable connection to a culture I was once so wholly immersed in. This notion that our tangible fit. That's a reasonable idea. If you grew up in, in some culture and then you leave and go to a different culture and you feel very connected to that culture, the first one, that's totally understandable. Same thing happened to me. Not nearly the same sort of certain extent as, um, what's it called? Going from one country to another country. I never had to learn a second language. You know, I never had to do any of that stuff, but we did move multiple times. Physical traits are what define identity is maybe but by the time I was three years old, we were back in Atlanta and stayed here for the entire time. So, yeah, ever since then, not much has changed. Be self-fetishization. And East Asian communities in the West focus frequently on physical traits because we are... By the way, I, I, I shouldn't... I know people won't believe me. I might have to prove it by, by all the witness accounts that I have. But I have memories since before I was three. I have, I have memories that I, that I ask my parents about and they go, how the hell do you remember that you were two years old? Things like that. So I do remember what it was like. And I remember being devastated moving schools, which I was in school basically my entire life. Preschool, pre, pre, preschool, pre Montessori, all that stuff. 
connecting ourselves to this extremely broad thing called being East Asian, which is full of very different and individual cultures. But they're grouped together because of a similarity in physicality. But simply looking East Asian can't be the main representation of a culture. Very Right, it's not the representation of a culture at all. Not the main, at all. Half writes, the children who wear saris and lehengas on TikTok and Instagram to sport their patriotism, who speak of brown skin and thick eyebrows as if these are cultural highlights rather than just a simplistic representation of identity. It's not a simplistic representation of their identity. I don't think there's anything wrong with this. They speak of, well, saris is, is a cultural thing and brown skin and thick eyebrows is a genetic thing. There is definitely an overlap, sure, but it, when you're when you're diving deep into it, you can separate the two, and there isn't such a blurred line between them when you're actually diving deep. Um, if we're having a five-minute video, then yeah, we can we can be a little we can speak with a bit more simpler terms. But in this kind of video, thirty-four minute video, yeah, you can you can compartmentalize brown skin, thick eyebrows. Um, yeah, they're not cultural highlights. They're just, I mean, sure, you can be proud of your ancestors for, for, nah, you shouldn't be proud. You can be grateful to your ancestors for creating you, for making you who you are. You can be, you can, you can feel blessed to have all the traits that you yourself have and, and feel happy about it. I think that's totally reasonable. I feel blessed to be who I am. Um, and couldn't have happened without the culmination of all the ancestors that I had who had brown skin and thick eyebrows. Identity. By only focusing on the tangible components of what makes them South Asian, they suggest that it is- Tangible? Okay. It's solely the physical qualities of a brown person that defines them. What is this, a fucking Cartesian? By diminishing everything but the physical, their representation of their own bodies results in a sexualized representation of brown bodies. Whoa, 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 whoa. If I go up to someone and I say, hey, bro, nice shirt. And they go, how dare you diminish my, uh, my video editing skills? And I'm like, bro, what the? I just met you. And they're like, yeah, but you didn't even know I edited videos. You didn't know these deep things about me that are clearly not tangible. And then you're going to point out the things that are tangible without mentioning that. It's the same sort of thing as, as you know, if you, it's like, it's like if you point out how, how beautiful a girl is, right? Like, damn, you're so beautiful, whatever. Now, that's objectification because you're not talking about, you know, the, the things that make me human, you know, the deeper things. Bro, what if I talk about that in a different sentence on a different day? It's stupid. It's stupid to point out one characteristic of someone to, or, or not even that, to, to, to assert that unless someone can understand you in your entirety, when literally that's actually impossible and you even you can't understand yourself in your entirety. If someone can't do that and also, you know, provide you with with um, a linguistic understanding of that and also be appreciative of that because that's the only way to not be uh, culturally like cultural appropriation or whatever the hell people talk about they have to be appreciative and love every single aspect of you in your entirety and also understand all of that and they have to somehow word that in a sentence that encapsulates all of it, not being vague, but, you know, specifying all of it in a reasonable amount of time and not take like years to talk about this, but, you know, in a simple compliment, well, I'm going to compliment you in your entirety. To assert that if somebody doesn't do that, that they're somehow sexualizing you, they're creating a false representation or whatever, bro, watch Evangelion. If that's your perspective, there is no such thing as communication. All communication is miscommunication. There is no possible way to transfer information from one from your head to another person's head with a 100% infinite bit rate, no packet loss transfer of communication. It's impossible. You have to accept that there will be limits in people's communication and limits in people's 
um, um, I guess, representation of people. If you're taking it as sexualized, you have to question whether or not people are actually sexualizing you or if you're imagining it as sexualized. In other words, a fetishization of who we are as people in the United And You know what? I don't even... Sexualization and fetishization are not the same thing. They're not. States. This is why I don't find it very activist of people who try to say that certain types of makeup are for East Asian people only. Because it reinforces this idea of physical traits defining us. I know this is kind of controversial to say, but... I get the point she's going to make. She's going to go into the point which is these East Asian countries are also at fault here because they're the one, they're partially the ones going like, hey, this is our culture, you know, only we can do this kind of thing. I see this kind of thing in the States with, you know, one race telling another race that they have the right to do something that the other race doesn't have, have the right to do. I'll talk about it in a different day when I know I won't get banned. But yeah, it's, 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 it's these very people that go like, that go like, oh, the foods I eat are the tangible part of my culture. And this is what I, I'm so proud of my culture. You can't eat these foods because it, and they reinforce that whole thing. And then they get mad when other people do the same thing. When other people go like, oh, you have to, I, I, I see this on MasterChef comments. Like, um, like there's like these Indian people on MasterChef, right? MasterChef Canada, MasterChef Australia, whatever. They go on there, they make some Indian food and they go like, yeah, this is Indian food. This is how it works. This is like, you know, even though Indian food is so like, they don't, the majority of India still doesn't have internet yet. And India is very, very culturally diverse. They all have basically the same skin color, but it's so extremely diverse. You will find places in India where people eat foods where other places in India, they would never imagine that other places in India, they don't even know those animals exist. There's some like, it's, it's that, it's that diverse. It's simply because like, People are connected to their own communities and there's a lot of intimacy. And this is sort of what happens in countries that are that big. Same thing you find in China. If you ever go to China, you'll find the same thing. Stay outside of the big cities <clears throat> and really go explore. You'll find the same sort of thing. <clears throat> also, there's way more surveillance in the big cities. There's surveillance everywhere, but there's way more surveillance in the big cities. You cannot escape the cameras. But it's those same people. You go to the comment section of the MasterChef videos of people making Indian. Just look up MasterChef Indian. And all those videos have tons of views because Indian people are like so, uh, they like, they're so proud of their country or whatever, right? Um, I don't really care. I'm not really all that like, you know, I hardly even speak Hindi and Gujarati and Urdu, which I can understand all three, but I, I can hardly speak them. But like, I, I, I never go around like, oh, you, you shouldn't, uh, you can't say these, these words that have been adopted into English um, because it's my culture or whatever, you know? And, and. When I look at these comments in these math chef videos, even though sometimes I'm like, I feel some, a sense of pride. I'm like, Hey, this is the food I, uh, I grew up eating. You know, I know it's pretty damn good. I'm so glad other people get to see how, like how flavor dense it actually is. That's it's a, Indian food is really focused on like savory stuff, you know? And I'm not one to be like, Oh yeah, this tangible thing is like some, it's a disrespectful to the culture to talk about the tangible things and, and, you know, be proud of it and be appreciative of it. I'm, I'm so like, that's the vast majority of all culture. I think saris are ugly, but if they look good, I would be like, damn, look, saris look cool, you know? Um, but what's it called? Yeah. You look at these master comments and they're like, I can't believe these people don't even understand Indian food. It's not like this. It's a, and they're so elitist, bro. And you know what? Half the time it's Indian people. Other half the time it's American people. But I'm going to put it out there as one possible contributing factor. Perhaps this contributes to why oftentimes East Asian natives who live in East Asia don't find cultural appropriation to be as problematic as East Asians living in the West. I see that as a good thing. Cultural appropriation is like a, is, is honestly a case by case basis thing. That's actually what it is. And people acting like it's not are is just foolish. Like if you've ever been to Asia, you know we love when people share our culture. We love, love, love when we see 
foreigner in Chipa. We love when we see them in kimono. We love that shit. Native. That's the thing though. I get that she's like making a, a parody video here, but you know people do that, right? You know people really do love when people share their culture. Like, and that's that's the real problem with like this these sorts of videos. It's they try to speak for everyone. They try to go like, yeah, um, you know, Asian people don't appreciate when you sexualize them or whatever. Bro, a lot of Asian people do. Some Asian people don't. A lot of Asian people do. Everything is a case-by-case -case basis. It's all an individual basis. I hear the same thing. Oh, you shouldn't objectify women. Bro, the most objectification I've ever seen are women objectifying other women, smacking their ass in the club and shit like that. Women objectify themselves the vast majority of the time around me, at least. So, um, yeah, people shouldn't speak for other people go like, yeah, uh, if you're like this, you're not going to get any pussy, bro. Women won't like you. Yeah, you clearly, no wonder you're single or whatever, even if that person's not saying, oh, no, yeah, no women will like you if you act like this. Bro, speak for yourself. East Asians don't find so much of their identity tied to their physical appearance because their appearance doesn't differentiate them from anyone else there. Pretty much everyone looks like that. Instead, the focus is more on actual cultural practices, experiences, niche slang in language and mannerisms. That can right, and this is the case everywhere. Can only be fully understood by someone who grew up in that cultural environment. Yeah, and that's why it's foolish to say I feel more Asian when you didn't grow up there. This is not me trying. But then again, this goes against the whole idea of what America considers diversity. I grew up in a in a vast majority black neighborhood in Atlanta. My school was about half black. OK, I, I go around, I drive around, I shoot videos. No, I shoot. Oh, I shouldn't say shoot. I got back into that habit because, you know, the, the saying around here is shoot or shoot because the. Because of this, so like I go around, I shoot, and um, every single one of the clients I've ever had in my entire life, with the exception of, with the exception of Sham, the first ever client who was Indian, just like us, or not Indian maybe, but Ismaili, my friends, my personal friends who are grew up in the same community, they're also Indian, um, so like. Three people total so far. Um, that's it. The rest of them have all been black. All of them. That's the community I grew up in. Yet, according to, you know, the 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 English speaking side of Twitter, I'm I'm clearly not a part of this culture. I clearly, you know, if I, you know, sing along to rap lyrics, they can be like, oh, you are this cultural appropriation, all this shit, all this bullshit, right? I, I don't even consider myself Indian at this point. I grew up eating Indian food. Um, I have brown skin. That's really about it. And I grew up eating all kinds of food, just like everybody else in America did. It, it, American food is all kinds of food. It's food from all over the world. So... Meanwhile, like one side, one side of the whole debate of, of people trying to determine how other people should live their lives is, is people telling people, oh, you can't cross over cultures like this because um, you're not this specific color or whatever. And your ancestors didn't come from this country or something like that. But on the other side of the debate is people telling other people what they shouldn't, should and should not do because they're saying... Yeah, you, your, uh, your culture is dehumanizing when you assess it as all these tangible, objective things. It's objective, so it's objectifying. So you shouldn't do that. It's pretty stupid when both sides are telling people how other people should live their lives, what they're doing right and wrong, not for themselves, but what other people should do. And one person, one side is saying... Culture is, is based on your genetics, and the other one is culture is based on how you are raised. Bro, 
at the end of everything, it always, I, I'll take a few leaps here, but if you think a bit and you play devil's advocate with yourself in your own brain, you get down to the funnel, it always comes down to, it's a case by case basis. It's an individual thing. Every individual has their own cultural uh, connections to many different kinds of cultures based on how they grew up and their genetics play a factor as well. To blame East Asian Americans or Canadians for... Like, when it comes to more intelligent people who don't, who, who are not like a, so simple-minded that like they view their entire identity as their race or whatever, they're often the people who join many other cultures. Go to a car meet, bro. Go to Cars and Coffee. Try, go to Cars and Coffee and try to pinpoint what is the most common race there. You might think like, hey, America's the majority white, right? Go to Cars and Coffee and try to tell me the majority of people there are white. You'd have a really tough time. You'd go there and, and if I send four people there, four people will come back with four different answers. One person would say it's Hispanic, one, people, one person would say it's white, one person would say it's black, one person would say it's Asian. Because it's, it's so extremely diverse and packed and you're always seeing so many different people, unless you're actively like paying attention, which maybe you can, you literally will not be able to tell which ethnic group makes up the majority of the car community. Now, it probably is white people because like the majority of car manufacturers are white and uh, the majority of cars sold are sold to white people. But if you weren't like just being logical about it, and even though I can't, I can't even know for sure, if you weren't just being logical about it, you really wouldn't know. Everyone's like, oh, these muscle cars and all this stuff. It's all like white people driving these like V8s, you know, that like gas guzzler cars, these like redneck, uh, you know, conservative people want to drive these like Mustangs or whatever, right? Bro, go to these car meets. The the Mustangs, the Camaros, the Mopars, the, the, the and all like the, the cars of that, that, that are auxiliary to that, even like the Chevy SS's and things like that. It's like 80% black from what I've seen. Maybe it's just, maybe it's because it, uh, I live in Atlanta. Maybe it's different in other places. But then again, that's proof in itself. Culture is an individual thing. It's what an individual experiences. I'm part of the car culture. And and I'm more, I'm more part of the car culture than I am part of Indian culture or American culture. People should prescribe to the cultures that they personally resonate with. That's, that's the option that you have to live in this world where with unlimited hierarchies and globalization at this level, that's what you can do. It would be a shame for people, if anything, it would be dehumanizing for people to not do that. People would be dehumanizing themselves if they don't go out there and go like, man, let me explore the world. Let me put myself in these situations and see what I resonate with personally, rather than asserting that, that my identity is solely based on this group identity even when time and time again, like this thing keeps on happening where like Asians will grow up in a family. They won't even know what kind of Asian they are. They'll get it wrong and they'll think they're that Asian their entire lives. Oh yeah, I'm Korean. They grew up, they turn like 25 years old and they're like, oh shit, I was actually Chinese the entire time. And then their entire like identity will, will be shattered because they put it in something so insecure. That's what it means to be insecure. That's what it means to have an insecure identity. It's not secure. You're putting it in something that can be changed if you look at your birth certificate and there's a different thing on there. Bro, if, if I look at my birth certificate and it says Sri Lankan or it says, you know, like uh, Bengali or Pakistani or whatever or any of this, any Istan, right? Or even any place in the Middle East, I'd be like, hmm, all right, cool. Moving on. On with my daily life. It doesn't impact my identity at all. Now, if something was like, yeah, um, f you're from like Brazil. I'd be like, okay, that's a bit weird, but not much to write home about. My identity is in things that are secure. My identity is in my skills, in like my, in, in this and in video editing and in what I've done for my own body and my own mind and you know, the things that I've cultivated and the knowledge that I have and the games that I've played and the media that I've consumed and in the fashion that I wear and in all these things that, that I personally have that are connected to who I am as 
a personality. See that? The little uh, Game and & Watch and the, uh, the Wi-Fi jammer. All these things. And like, I look at my desk, I see real nice speakers and headphones and a, a protein shake bottle, like a blender bottle, and this squeeze thing to increase my forearm strength that's right here because I like squeeze it every single day and multiple mouses and like this sick mic and this wireless charger and a double monitor, double monitor setup and this mirror cube as well and another one of these wrist things because I have to increase pinky strength as well and this one really does that. And um, I don't know, like a box cutter and random stuff like that. But I look at my desk and I'm like, yeah, no, this is this is my identity. This is way, way deeper, uh, way deeper inside of my identity than if somebody looks at my birth certificate and they, they look at the where I'm from, ethnicity, and they see that, they can make judgments about me. If they look at my desk and they make judgments about me based on what's on my desk, they will be a million times more accurate on my personality if they look at my desk. Because that's where I put my personality into the things around me and into who I am and into what I've learned and things like that. So, and those are things that people cannot take away from me. Yeah, people can take these things away from me. People cannot take away from me the fact that I know how to solve Rubik's Cube or that I love Nintendo games or that I can use a Wi-Fi jammer. People cannot take away my knowledge and what's deeper inside. And that's not a thing that I, I will go like, oh, that's Indian culture or Asian culture or whatever. Maybe the hacking thing might be a bit of Indian culture, maybe a little, okay? Because I've learned that from Indians. But when people are don't have culture, when people don't have their own culture, they have to they have to go like, oh, look at what these people are offering me as a part of a, 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 a collective ethnic culture. They can tell me what my culture is because I don't have one of my own and I'm too lazy to go out and think for myself and actually find one for myself. I'm just going to listen to what they have to tell me. And people do that. And so it's really, actually, when you really look at it, it's, I mean, I took a few leaps in the beginning, but this is what I mean when I say all culture is dehumanizing. It all, all of it is. Um, and you can be fine with that. You can dehumanize me all you want. Get, play, play smash or pass with me. Give me a rating one out of 10. Who cares, bro? That's, a, that's as objectifying as it can be. Giving a number rating, giving a objective number rating to a person is as clear cut as objectification as you can possibly do to someone. I don't care, <laughs> do it. Because my self worth is not in these things that are so insecure. It's not in these things that are so, oh, actually you're not this race. It's not tied to my race or whatever. My culture is not tied to my race. It's not tied to things that, that people have to tell me and I, I, I can't know for, my, know for sure for myself. I know for damn sure for myself that I love cars, all right? I know that for a fact. No one needed to tell me that, okay? My self-worth are in things that are secure. And that's why these people fall apart so much. That's why people break down and get so offended at everything. Because they're not secure. If someone tells you, you're, you're, you're a tree, are you going to be like, oh my God, that's so hurtful. You're going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? That doesn't even relate. How is it even an insult? It doesn't even compute to me. If someone comes up to me, like you see how skinny I am, right? If some, I'm, I'm below the negative fifth percentile in my weight for my height. If someone calls me fat, I'm not going to be offended. I'm going to be like, yo, what are you talking about? Like, are you, if anything, are you good? Are you blind? Like, can you, can you see right? I'm, I'm more concerned than anything else. So people getting offended at things, at, at their, their culture being this and that, it's literally, it says more about them than it does about the person offending their culture or appropriating their culture or whatever. It says more about them because they're, get, they're willing to get offended at it. Them being offended is a sign from one part of their brain to the other part of their brain. Like, hey, maybe your self-worth shouldn't be so contingent on things that other, other people can so easily take away from you. Everybody else can wear the same saris and shirts and whatever. Everybody else can eat the same foods and have the same sort of tangible things. Maybe you shouldn't put your self-worth in here. And that's what being offended is. It's a sign from yourself to your other self, and you should take it as such.
feeling more defensive about their... That's why I don't appeal to people who get offended at things. I don't respect them. Um, I mean, when someone, if someone, you know, their parents died and I make some parent joke about parents and they get offended at that, totally reasonable. But when people get offended at like the most innocuous things that they're not even offended by, that they're not even a group of, like white girls being offended, or 14 year old white girls being offended on behalf of like 30 year old Mexican dudes, when they go, oh, Mexican people like tequila, and like, how could you say that? Yeah, when, when people are offended at those kinds of things, I don't have any respect for them. It's also why I don't have respect for people who say sorry at everyone because they have respect for people who get offended at everything. And I can't even have respect for that. Physical qualities. I will not ignore the long history of Westerners treating cultural clothing as dress up and excluding East Asian features from beauty. I know what it feels like to just want blonde hair and blue eyes rather than my small model. Wow, this girl is like really, I mean, then again, I don't know what it's like to have so, so much negative emotion rushing through me. I don't know, you know? <clears throat> In fact, I did not know what puberty was. Like, I didn't know, you know, like people are like, oh, you know, you're gonna have a lot of questions about your body. Bro, I had no questions. I learned about puberty in high school. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I just assumed like, yeah, when people grow, they change. That's part of growth. It never even occurred to me, any of this stuff. Like uh, the voice cracking just seemed like a totally normal thing and all this stuff. Now, when females go through puberty, before puberty, they're basically the same as men in terms of negative emotion. During and after puberty, I mean, I guess they, they might feel more self-conscious about themselves um, because of the feedback loops that create anxiety. Who knows, right? Who knows? I wouldn't know. But <clears throat> this thing that she said right here, is really stupid because once again, it's insecure. The history of what people did that's literally just been written by people who once again, they will say history is written by the victors, which I have a video, uh, I'm not gonna link it, just look it up on my channel. It's called history is not written by the victors um, or it's called is history really written by the victors? Sorry to give you the answer, spoil it for you if you didn't already, if you couldn't come to that conclusion on your own already. But, <clears throat> gets more complicated than what I wrote in that SOC, but I did, I put it anyways, okay? But this right here is so stupid that it makes sense that immediately afterwards she would say, I know what it's like to want blue eyes and blonde hair. Bro, I never knew what that was like. I never cared about that. I never once, in fact, I didn't even realize it. I know what it's like to want big muscles. That's why I go to the gym every day. I still want big muscles. I still want to look, I still want to, you know, be able to do a muscle up. I still want to be able to do dips with more than just my body weight. I want to be able to do 20 dips with, you know, with chains hanging from me. That's what I really want to do. You know, I want to be able to do a hundred pushups nonstop. Um, not that it's like all that great for your health to do that many pushups nonstop. You'd probably want to blow it up a bit, but I still want to have the option to do that. You know, I want to do these things. But they have nothing to do with my race or anything like that. They have nothing to do with we, me wanting different colored eyes. That's so stupid. And um, maybe I shouldn't even be watching this video because I can't understand where she's coming from. I've never, I never saw someone with a different color skin and been like, man, I want that color skin. I don't even pay attention to my own color skin. I hardly see my own color skin. The only time I ever look in the mirror is in the morning when I'm like brushing. That's it. And I don't even pay attention. I look at my teeth. And then I'm done. I never look at the mirror again. I never get out of the shower and go, let me make my hair or anything like that. I really don't care. I could care less. Actually, I couldn't care less. So I really can't relate. Like, dude, I wear sweatpants every single day, inside and outside. I sleep in the same clothes that I go around in. And I wear white tees all the time because I'm tired of doing two separate laundry loads. I just want to do laundry loads for all white, all at once. I'm tired of like separating them out, right? And all of my sweatpants are dark. So it's, it's, it's simple and I still have to do two separate laundry loads, but it's relatively simple. Um, and that's like, I, I value the functionality in these things in my life. I, I would never ever consider myself to ever like wear makeup or wear jewelry or 
spend time thinking about what outfit I'm going to wear or make my hair or things like that. So it's like, yeah, maybe I just can't relate at all and it's just not my video to react to. But I'm going to do it anyways. And excluding East Asian features from beauty. I know what it feels like to just want blonde hair. Why did she edit a zoom in right there, bro? That's pretentious as fuck to say that right here. And blue eyes rather than my small monolids and dark hair. It can be very... In monolids? See, like solid color, like brown or black, dark brown or black, uh, what's it called? Eyes? Monolids. I, I would assume lids would be eyelids, but... Maybe, the, I don't know. Powering to appreciate these physical features that have been looked down on for so long. Once again, if you're insecure, when people look down on you, when people try to say something that's inaccurate about you or whatever, you get offended. Because you think that people look down on it, so so it's, it's, um, it's, har it's har harmful or hurtful or... You know, it's affected my life and I know what that's like. But dude, I don't care about what if someone tells me that, oh, you know, it sucks to have brown eyes. You should have blue eyes. Okay. Just going to go on about my day with my inferior eyes then, I guess. So, yeah, no, I, I don't ever... I guess it's because I'm not so insecure and I've actually had the foresight and intelligence to put my self-worth into things that people can't just take away so easily from me just by like changing what's in the history books in schools. Yeah, because I've done that, I, I, these problems don't affect me, but I guess if you haven't done that and you're still very insecure and you don't have that much self-respect for yourself uh, and you don't have that much esteem for yourself, then I guess when someone says, this thing has been looked down upon and you have that thing, I guess you would subconsciously go like, oh, I guess I'm just inferior. This thing is so bad. I hate that I have it. I, I don't care. Through appreciation and drawing attention to our different appearance, we can help normalize East Asian traits. They're not exotic or ugly or strange. Why are you speaking for other people? I've heard so many East Asian people talk about their traits as exotic as like we're special, even though they're literally the vast majority of people on planet Earth. They belong to normal human beings. And I've, I've also seen many people go like, hey, we are not normal. Who wants to be normal? Speak for yourself. You know, we can normalize these things. Yeah, there's plenty of people who don't want them to be normalized. Have you ever, has it ever occurred to you that maybe you shouldn't normalize everything? That when everything is normalized and homogenous and everyone is the same, that there is no such thing as that kind of diversity that people love so much anymore, that there is no appreciation for that. And I feel like this sort of thing comes out of resentment. I feel like she's, she's making a stupid argument here because she herself can admit that she has felt... Mm, not cultural. She might say it's cultural, but pressure to be one way that she's not, right? Oh, blonde hair, blue eyes, whatever, right? Or, or like white, what did she say? White skin, blue eyes, blonde hair, blue eyes? I don't know. Whatever she said. She, she like, uh, she said, if she can think that way, then she can admit that there is a difference. In which case, no one is like normal. If you want to normalize things, you're only claiming that you want to normalize things because you want things to be considered a certain type of way. But normalizing everything literally takes away the entire uh, idea of, it strips away the entire idea that there are any differences between these. That one is more exotic or unique or whatever than the other. Because that's what it means for there to be differences. And that's not going to happen because you admitted just now in this video, by your very nature, without like anyone trying to like... Uh, explicitly outright tell you that like or maybe someone did but you admitted that you fell for it you admitted that that you felt deep down that you felt you know what it's like to feel to want to be this certain type of way that you are not even if you manage to convince the whole world to normalize 
that all people of all different appearances are actually the same, there will still be people who deep down have these natural tendencies to go, man, I want to look like that. Or man, I w they, they should want to look like me. And they'll see people as different based on how they look. They'll see people as different because they'll see people as different. To, to deny that part of yourself, if anything, that's dehumanizing. That's a natural part of being human. To judge a book by its cover. If anything is dehumanizing to say, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. We should normalize this, this thing that is anti-human. I'm not saying this is the argument I, I want to make. I'm just saying it's very easy to dismantle our arguments here. What becomes a problem is when the depiction of physical features is... Ah, side note on cultural appropriation. When people talk about cultural appropriation, they tend to make very stupid arguments. I'm going to skip this part. Switching gears a little bit while still talking about physical appearance, something I know a lot of people take issue with is the sexual fetishization of East Asian girls yeah. and women. This is the biggest problem with anime. This is the this is the this is the reason why I don't actually show anime to anyone anymore. It is the main problem with it. I can ignore it now. I can get over it. I can just, you know, let it slip my mind and just focus on the story. But in the world we live in, I can't expect that of anyone else unless they, 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 they're really, really open-minded like that. Like, for some reason, there is like a debate online on like Twitter and stuff from what I've heard about like lollies and child porn and all this stuff. But really, dude, to me, if someone like a... Uh, I don't care if they're like, oh, I would never watch child porn. I would never, you know, want to have sex with someone underage. I just like lollies. Bro, I don't care if it's just that. You're not getting around me or my kids, bro. I don't have kids, but if I had kids, you're not getting around any of us. I'm keeping you away. I'm filing a restraining order on you, bro. That's like, to me, it, it, it makes no difference. Hardly a difference. Men, due to their more innocent and cute appearance. It is very problematic, don't get me wrong. But I also noticed that East Asian entertainment is just- When people use the words like normalize and sexualize and objectify and all like the new words, right? All the new words that are, that are being used more and more colloquially now. It's like, bro, use a few of them. Okay, cool, you got it. But when you're gonna like use Don't like wrong. All, like problematic and all this like when you're gonna use all of them these words that really have not even been like thoroughly defined yet, dude. You're building an argument on a foundation of a house of cards. But I also noticed that East Asian entertainment is generally more cute oriented. There's a whole concept of agio in Korea. Yeah, and, uh, you know, this exists in cultures all over the world. This exists still in the United States as well. Um, but, I mean, dude, I've never seen a child beauty pageant happen anywhere outside of America. So, but the whole, like, uh, cute factor of this whole thing, there is, there is potentially a genetic component to it. And I, that's all, that also might be backed up by the fact that, like, from from what I know, this this happened, like, uh, there was a lot of, like, cute art, like, arts made, artistic expression made by, like, people in Asia, particularly places like Japan and Korea, way before the internet was a thing, way before globalization at this level was even a thing, way before, um, what's it called, even the 20th century, in the, in the 1800s, this was still a thing. So, yeah, self-fetishization, sure. Kauai in Japan and- Wait, 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 wait. Self-fetishization aren't the only problem. Oh, I thought she was making the argument that like, fetishization of other people fetishizing, that would be a much more intelligent argument to make because that isn't the only problem. It, it isn't the only problem that like, um, you know, Americans are out here trying to be weeaboos. Like everyone knows that, but the the fetish I oh stuff okay never mind I have no idea what the hell she's even saying 
self like these cultures fetishize these things themselves these uh these stereotypes don't come from nowhere Sajiao in china which is quote to deliberately act like a spoiled child in front of someone because yeah and this is not some product of like america you know wanting to do this and they find an outlet in in uh, south asian or south, like east asian countries right nah if it was they wouldn't degrade themselves so much and do this if it was only america the the vast majority of factors that push like females to do this kind of stuff is in uh what's it called east asia it is in the whole like looking pure innocent feminine like a child basically not having any sort of masculine traits and this exists also in men as well that's why the k-pop industry is the way that it is because of the aware because you don't see this behavior all that much in the states you see it now on twitter but twitter is an exception twitter is the culmination of the degeneracy of planet earth okay you can't judge your worldview off of that but yeah this exists way more in asia than it does in the states that's not trivial awareness of the other person's affection the literal meaning of sajiao is to incite tenderness by childishness. Yeah, you gotta take... I, I had an idea, it's on my channel, but you gotta take a bunch of these kinds of girls, right? Who, like, pretend to be, like, child children or whatever, and who, like, they, like, speak in lowercase letters. You gotta take a bunch of these girls, these, like, 25-year-old girls, by the way, older than me, and you gotta take them and put them all on an island and see how long they survive stranded on an island. I want to see what they do. That would make it for a great, for some great entertainment. I want to see what they do. I want to see who gives up first and who holds out the longest and still tries to act like a child. Or if they all just act like babies and they all just like don't do anything and they have to be rescued. I, I really want to know what happens. In order to be coquettish, K-pop idols are frequently asked to do agyo, and it's seen as an important skill. Wait. I thought Aegyo was uh, the face, you know, the like the fucking, you know, that like hentai face, whatever. Uh, that's what that was. Yo, I can't watch this, bro. This is this is Aegyo. This is terrifying to watch. It's uncanny. One Korean female respondent said, say there are two similar female workers. One is very formal. She is very skilled at work. Then the men say she is spiteful. There is another worker who is slightly less skilled but has agio. Then a lot of male workers try to help her out. That's totally natural though. I mean, if you can convince someone that you have more childlike traits, people want to help you out. You, I'm sure you've experienced this in your own life. You're out in public. You don't care about any of the adults. Is a little kid who needs help like reaching something or whatever, you're going to help them out. You're going to go out of your way to help them out. Even if they're not your kid, even if they have nothing to do with you, even if you never see them ever again. Childlike cute traits make you want to help someone out. Oh, that's a hack. That's a life hack. Oh my God. Yeah. Any place that this is not a popular thing, like egg yo or whatever, bro, you can develop this and work your way up the ranks, bro. Oh, wait, this is a thing in the States. Not in terms of, not in the form of agio. Bro, you know how many dudes, like, were out here trying to, like, fuck with Millie Bobby Brown while she was underage? You know how many dudes were, like, how many rappers were actually fucking with, uh, what's it called, Daniel Brigoli while she was, I'm not calling her by her rapper name. You know how many, uh, dude, rappers actually did fuck with her while she was underage? Or, bro, I know rappers personally who have fucked with Ruby Rose before she was of age. Like when she was like 16, 17 in high school. And these rappers, like big rappers, like A-listers. Like A-listers were fucking with her when she was living in Atlanta, going to like football games with my friends. Or not, like basketball games and shit like that. She didn't really go to that many football games. But when she was like hanging out with all these people, going to Rolling Loud with all these people... These rappers were literally, like, flying her out, fucking with her. They were all, like, 25, 30-year-old rappers. And she's, like, a 16-year-old girl. And nobody cares. 
And now she's like super famous too. So you really can work your way up the, the corporate ladder if you find the right ladder and if you have the right set of innocent traits or pretend that you do. To the female senior slash boss, it would not seem very good. But if there are men at the workplace, especially if they are in charge, then it would be effective. That's totally reasonable. Huh. I gotta watch out for that when I'm in the corporate space because the more childlike someone acts, you know, I, th this thing would work, by the way. I, I, I took advantage of this in some sense too. I'd be at music video shoots and there'd be like 20 other videographers there and I would stand out because I'd be like, oh, damn, bro, I gotta head back. I got school tomorrow. And they'd be like, bro, what the, they'd be like, you know, not like A-list, but they'd be like B-list rappers there, right? And uh, they'd be like, damn, bro, what the fuck? This guy has school tomorrow? Bro, go, go, go home, go to, go to school, whatever. Even if I didn't have school, I would still say, or if I was willing to ditch, I would still say it. Um, and then I would show up the next day and be like, oh, I'm ditching class or whatever. I'd make myself seem more like a child because they would view me as more as a, they would, they would be like, okay, this kid is, he hasn't been corrupted yet to the same level. He can be trusted more and things like that, right? He's more impressionable. And, and a lot of these guys who were like mad successful would kind of in part sort of like try to be like, okay, let me take this person under my wing. Not really all that consciously, but I would see the behavior emerge where they would be more forgiving with me and my work, you know? It really did help me out. Being Doing photography before you're an adult is like a real, it's a, it's a, it's a nice little cheat code. Doing any of this sort of stuff before you're an adult is a real cheat code. And you can, being young gives you a real advantage because everyone's like, oh, this person is like a young, rich person, young millionaire, young billionaire, whatever, right? Everyone always wants to focus on being young. For some reason, everyone values being young. Personally, I don't care all that much. I literally made the philosophers tier list. Every single philosopher that I considered one of the greats was always old as shit when they were coming up with their philosophies. But, um, I mean, sometimes they, sometimes they died young. So they, but, um... Yeah, this works. It's not would be effective. It is effective. It does work. I've seen it. I've literally used that strategy myself. All this other research I read found that it's extremely popular for young women to act in this cute, childish way towards their husbands or boyfriends. And the men respond quite positively. I think men and women, okay, this is weird. This is uncanny. And this is not subtle. This is not subtle. I feel like if you did it in a subtle way, right? With subtle cues, subtle kinds of makeup, saying things subtly like how mentioning like, oh, bro, I got a head, I got to go to school, you know? It would really work not only on men, but also on women. It would work on everyone. The, if she's talking about this and that this is working on men, bro, that's weird. That's a red flag. <laughs> In this research paper, they ask their respondents how important Aegyo is in a romance. I wonder if it's as painful to her to watch this stuff as it is for me. It's like, it's actually painful to watch because I don't know how she found all this, bro. Romantic relationship on a scale of one to five. Wait, then what's the face thing? If this is Aegyo, then what's the hentai face? The one that's like on all those like memes and like the, there's that one like hoodie of it, like that's like, super popular among all these like shit posts, right? Like the cursed memes and stuff. What is that? If this is Aegyo? Maybe it means a different thing like in the States. I don't know. Maybe it means a different thing in... No, she's already talking about degenerates. I don't know. Percent said four and 20% said five. A lot of them, including women, believed that men liked women who could do agyo and that women needed to be able to do agyo to be likable. Korea, as well as some other East Asian cultures, encouraged the idea. Having childlike traits makes you more palatable. It makes you, it makes your insufferable traits a little less insufferable. If um, the way that my like little cousins act when we're like, you know, playing pool and stuff like that, or like, I guess billiards, right? But when, when we're like doing these things or like playing games or watching movies or whatever, the way they act, if like 
if I saw adults act in the same way as like my eight year old cousins, I'd be like, bro, shut the fuck up. But because it's them, I get it. But this is not the same thing. This is blatant. This is not any sort of subtle, like, um, like any sort of subtle kind of innocence of like not knowing how to throw a frisbee and things like that. You know, this is not that. This is grown adults trying to act like children. It's uncanny. It's obvious. And dude, that would, that would like tick me off. That would set off some red flags. And I'd be like, yeah, no, I got to stay away from this person. Idea that a woman's it's sketchy. It's sketchy. I, I don't know what, what it is. Cute helplessness is crucial to both professional and social. Yeah, but if they're an adult and you could very clearly, clearly see that they're not helpless, then that should like set it off. Like, hey, don't fall for this. Korean women are literally criticized for not having a gyo, and parents teach their children what? to do it from a very young age. Damn, wait, I didn't know it was like that. So, yes, it's really cringe when white people try to copy a gyo or. Wait, there's a way bigger problem here. <laughs> She's like, it's wait, it's cringe when. Bro, I would not be proud of this culture. There's a way bigger problem than white people trying to copy a gyo. There's a. Parents are teaching their kids how to do it? Bro, I, I think you got bigger fish to fry than whatever the hell you're talking about here. Or go like, kawaii. But we also can't ignore the cultures that pressure women to act in infantile ways. Okay, in never mind. They, they, might, they might be equally bad problems. Never mind. That's too cringe, bro. They might be equally bad. In fact, Aegyo is often thought of as being innate. People say things like, No, it's not innate. Not at all. Oh, they just have a- Okay, wait. There are some girls I know that have extremely high-pitched voices. We were actually literally talking about this the other- uh, Yesterday. What the hell? Yeah, we were talking about this yesterday. Where this dude um, asked me like- He was about his smileys. You won't know these people. If you check my other streams, you might know them. But it was this girl, Mehet Kimani, and this other girl, Arisha Captain. Arisha Captain is- I swear to God- I'm not trying to like exaggerate. She's four foot something. She's not five feet. I know what five feet looks like. My mom is five foot tall. My mom is five feet tall. She's less. She's my age. She, we had classes together. She went to high school with me. She sat next to me in some of them. I would see her in the hallways all the time. She, I, we knew each other since we were relatively little because we were in the same religious sect, right? Um, and we had those classes together as well. Her voice is extremely high pitched. She sounds like a fucking bunny rabbit. Like, I don't know. She sounds like the way you would assume a bunny rabbit would sound. And she's like, really? She's like a, she's a squeaker. She's like an IRL squeaker. Oh my God. That's what she is. She's an IRL squeaker. Um, and then there's this other girl, Mahat Kamani. What a stupid ass conversation. Um, and she's like, Mahat Kamani's like fat, like fucking, and she, she's one of these fat girls who think she's like hot shit. You know, that's a real problem when they think they're all that, right? but they have like no self-control. Um, and she's about as ugly as it gets. She looks like, a, hmm, I wouldn't say pig because pigs have sort of a, they, they have a, a smoothness to them. I would say not a domesticated pig. She looks like a boar, like a wild boar, you know, or like a, or like a, or like a groundhog or something. You know, she reminds me of something with like really, she has really odd facial features, dude. So the whole thing was like, I joined the call and they're like, okay, would you rather fuck Matt Kamani or Aricha Captain? And I'm like, yeah, okay. Aricha Captain is at least not shaped like a blueberry. She's shaped like a normal person, right? So naturally you would assume that. But then I thought about it for a second and FaZe was like, oh no, nah, bro, uh, I'd rather fuck Matt Kamani. And I, I guess that's part of the culture now to like want girls with like, a lot of cellulite, right? So I, I thought about it and I'm like, let me put myself in his shoes. And I'm like, oh shit, now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, she, uh, Arisha is a red flag. She talks in like a really, really high pitched voice, like a super high pitched voice. I think a lot of that might be natural, but I know some of it is not. I know some of like the whole like trying to act cute that she does is not natural. She tries to act like super, super innocent and um, it's cap, bro, it's cap. I know it. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, it's a red flag. I can't exactly put my finger on like what it is, but 
I would stay away. I would stay away. Yeah, Mehet Kamani is like unattractive to the highest order, but I'd rather fuck someone who's unattractive to the highest order than fuck someone who's completely off limits. A Risha captain is just off limits. And then afterwards they were like, I, we were testing you, we were testing you, it's a test. And I'm like, Phew, pass the test. But yeah, um, there is, I have, I have a cousin or an aunt, I don't know exactly, it's hard to tell, but I have a relative who lives in Texas and she talks with a really, really high pitched voice, much older than me, she's an adult, she's married and she talks with a very high pitched voice. Um, she doesn't talk with a super high pitched voice. She doesn't reach anywhere close to these agio levels, but she's like, she's like, I don't know. I don't know how to replicate it. Um, but I remember how she sounds. I don't know. It's like super high pitch, but I think that's a bit more natural. I've never heard her in my entire life talk with any, like even a slightly lower pitch than that. So that one seems more natural to me. So maybe it is a little more natural in some people, but not at this level. They were born with it. This idea of Aegyo being given to people by nature furthers the idea that to be cute is inherent. It ties the idea of cute, baby-like cheerfulness as being part of a person's essence. Well, some, and this goes back to nature versus nurture, right? I guess outside of, of that kind of culture, people would sense more of the bullshit rather than trying to teach the, oh my God, this is the same sort of thing as, as People in the States going like, oh, oh yeah, don't text back too early, play these games and do all these things to basically manipulate your way to the top of the sexual marketplace. The same sort of thing. And perhaps that supports why some Westerners end up believing that East Asians are just by nature cuter. Um, why is this like her talking point? There's, there's bigger fish to fry than what Westerners think of East Asians. I think East Asians are cuter. I think they are. I think they they stay, or not that they're cuter, I think they stay cute longer into their adulthood. Um, I wouldn't wanna, if I was in Japan, I wouldn't wanna hook up with a girl who's my age. I would wanna hook up with a girl who's a little older. I would wanna hook up with a girl who I know would make a good mother. Um, because the 22-year-old girls in Japan, they look almost indistinguishable from like the 18-year-old girls, 17-year-old girls. In the States, I can very clearly tell the difference. In the States, I can, I can tell you if a girl is a, a senior in high school versus a senior in college. I know the difference. But actually, sometimes the line gets blurred. But in Asia, dude, they stay... Maybe I'm being biased by anime, but from what I've seen, they stay looking really, really young, like all until like, damn, until menopause, actually. That's crazy. There is a smaller group of East Asians. And also, East Asians don't tend to overeat and get fat nearly to the same extent as other, other cultures, even Indians. Um, you see a lot of like, Women who, the moment they get married, they just let themselves go. They don't try anymore and they become extremely fat. I don't see that very much in, in Asian culture. I, of course, I see it. But I don't see it that much. That definitely contributes to the factor. And I personally, I don't think it's anything bad. Maybe it is bad. Maybe this makes me a terrible person. Maybe I'm a fucked up person in the head, right? But I see like the, the Asian people who... I guess mainly mainly Japanese people. So this is biased by anime. Mainly Japanese people, I do see them as cuter. Mm, yeah, and it definitely is biased by anime. I don't see Japanese guys as cute or like, I see them as pathetic. I see them as pathetic little boys, infants who are too old to be infants, but stay infants their entire lives and will do nothing as a result of it. That's what I see these people as. But the girls, I see them as cuter. So yeah, it definitely is an anime-driven thing. Asians who dislike this way of behavior because they believe it subjects women to a childish image. One respondent in this study said, for instance, in group work, there's always one person who does agio when apologizing for not doing his or her work. His? 
bro, who's writing this? What a, what a, what a time to be alive. It's like saying, oh, I'm weak, I'm innocent, I'm cute, and so you must help me do everything. And you know what? If people are actually weak and innocent and cute, there is a natural tendency to do that. But when people just fake it and, and people don't see through it, like people are, are, are just pretending like they are, it's the most pathetic thing. It's man, it's literally man-child behavior. And that's gross. It's like putting oneself into extreme passivity and that is not good. With all that being said, it is. That's true. That's true. But that is a different, so, I mean, I guess it leads into a different, that's not, it's not different, but it leads into a different thing. I've seen um, the cutest things, in my opinion, that I've ever seen are not people trying to be passive and saying, let me do everything. It's more people who are passive, who are weak and are basically helpless, trying to do way, trying to bite off way more than they can chew. That's really the cutest things. It's it's not when people go, oh, I can't do this. I need help. It's when people who literally cannot do that and need help try to do it anyways because they're so young and helpless and so ignorant to the idea that they can't do it. That they think they can. They think they can do everything. And that's really what's cute when like, um, when like little kids are beginners at games. Like I described pool, right? When like my little cousins are playing pool and they're trying to use the pool stick and they're like, Oh, and they like scratch the board with the thing and all that stuff. It wasn't my pool table. So I wasn't like tripping about it. Um, and they, they were like crazy, stupid, rich, literally custom made pool table with the names of the families on there. So yeah, um, family members on there. But so I, I wasn't tripping about it, but they were like scratching the pool table. And I'm like, I'm like, damn, that's so cute. They're like learning, you know? So if anything, it's the opposite. If anything, I could see a bit of a distinction here. People trying to be helpless when they're not, that is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum on what I appreciate versus people who are helpless trying to be helpful. It's possible that I, being Canadian born and raised, do not comprehend the deeper complexities of cute culture. Egyo, kawaii, and sajiao have- Not just possible, basically certain. Connect and neither do I. And that's something you have to accept going into this kind of thing. There will never be 100% understanding of anything that anyone does. You can never truly know precisely exactly what's going on in another person's mind, let alone an entire culture. Connections to more foundational social belief. So that's why I hate when people make these kinds of disclaimers. Like this is obvious. Everyone knows this. And if you don't know this, you're just a fool. You're a fool. And if you don't realize this already. For instance, you don't need to make this disclaimer. Being good at agio is not just about being good at pouting and talking in a high-pitched voice. It's actually taken as a sign of social intelligence. Knowing when the right social situation is to use agio and how to use it well in that situation is... I guess if it's successful, if it works in that culture, right? If it works and you're doing it, I guess that is socially intelligent. Nobody would ever say, ever dare to say Cleopatra, the woman who spoke nine languages and seduced two of the, the most powerful men on the planet. And then again, later on, the most powerful man on the planet after that, nobody would ever say she's not socially intelligent for, for using her, her wit and her body and her, um, understanding of the meta of the sexual culture at the time to, to get, to climb the, to climb the political, to climb every ladder of society actually, and become the queen of the Nile, you know? So if it's successful, if it works in that culture, I don't think it would work here. Maybe it does to an extent, but if it works in that culture, then I guess it is emotionally and socially intelligent. Seen as socially and emotionally intelligent. It's also commonly used as a method of gentle rejection to subdue negative interactions in an effort to maintain social harmony. That I've seen, I've seen um, in the States. Germany. There are researchers who propose that this cute childish behavior is actually a strategic way for women to empower themselves. Once again, the word empower, bro. I hate the word empower. Is that really empowering? 
is it? Is conforming to the desires of what men want, or not even what men want, what, what other women claim that men want, is just conforming to those desires and being exactly what that is? Is that empowering? Yeah, it's, it's, you have to define what empowerment is first before you make a video like this. In more conservative countries. So maybe I too am reducing Aegyo, Kawaii, and Sajiao to merely their physical components. Um, there's no reason to even say that. As if that's like a bad thing. Anyone can have an opinion on anything. If, the, if, if someone says, no, you have to know a certain amount about something to have an opinion on it, then nobody can have an opinion on anything ever because people will always raise the standard. Without fully understanding the culture they represent. Well, you can't. No one can. Even people deeply embedded in the culture who control the culture cannot fully understand it. So it's stupid to assume that like, that like for some reason your words mean less because you don't fully understand it. Yeah, your words do mean less, but it's, it's stupid to assume that like maybe you shouldn't be saying this as a result. I would really be interested in knowing what some native East Asians think about this. She's not very intelligent. Now we arrive at the part where people click off because I'm basically only referencing academic journals and no TikToks. So, uh... Ah, yeah, done with the video. Exotic, fetish, yellow fever, oriental gaze, colonialism... Yellow fever. Oh, wait, that makes so much sense. I've never heard people use yellow fever like that, but that's really on point. Huh. I wonder I'd never heard about that. That makes, like, total... Huh and white people bad. I think that'll hold people's attention for a little longer. It'll hold my attention Edward for a Saeed little longer. coined the term Orientalism, which refers to when Asia is labeled as having some inherent essence that is distinctive from the West, leading to stereotypical images and tropes of Asianness. Quote, You know, she's perpetuating this by assuming that there's a difference. By saying to people, I would love to hear some native Asians take on this, as if native Asians would have a different take on this. To assume that is to, is to imply that there is a distinctiveness in the culture that someone not a part of that culture cannot understand. It's, it's like pretty blatant, dude. It's Fundamental to the Orientalist fantasy is the assumption that the eternal uniform- Whether or not it's a fantasy or not, if anything, this is this is as good as it gets. If you're gonna compartmentalize different cultures and say that there's differences between them, to assume that one of them is a fantasy and it's like so great and exotic and so special, if anything, that's the highest possible praise you can have in this kind of situation, right? I'd be very happy about that. Form Orient is incapable of self-definition and thus necessitates objective Western scientific categorization. What? Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Once again, she made her own objective Western scientific categorization just now by implying that there is one because people who are native would know something about this that she doesn't. She just did that. So I guess she's, you know, she's just the Western, you know, she's a colonial, she's a colonizer, bro. She's a colonizer. Asianness is something that's often thought of as mythical or exotic, and it's positioned as opposite. Yeah, if I was like deeply embedded in the culture and very insecure and I saw my identity as Asian, I would be flattered if people talk about my culture this way. To the rational... Like look at how people look at other cultures, bro. Look at how the world views like... Bro, I don't think uh, like Germans have ever recovered. And not only... I don't think, you know, I don't think Muslims or Christians or Jews are under the best light ever. Um, neither are, uh, Hindus, neither are, neither are atheists, neither is like really anyone. If someone views my, my culture as like some fantasy world, like some Narnia shit, bro, I'd be flattered beyond belief. 
scientific modern West. To really sell this story of East versus West, the essence of each is defined in broad abstract terms. I feel like this also comes from the fact that people want to disrespect the East saying like, oh, their Eastern medicine is so, it's so rudimentary and it's not based off of any kind of science and all this stuff. There's a lot of factors that play into this. A lot more factors than, than mm, she's not even mentioning any, but it doesn't really matter. Rather than actually pointing to any specific social practices or institutions. I just did. I just pointed to one. Think of the very Eastern general medicine. dichotomies people make, such as rational versus spiritual, individualistic versus collectivist, modern versus traditional. These are used to describe Eastern countries versus Western countries. It's quite absurd. To what? What? Okay, I can kind of see rational versus spiritual. I can kind of see that to an extent. But those are... It's, it's so, so few and far between, but I do see that as a trend. Individualist. This, I don't see at all that people are, or maybe people are, but they're stupid if they're describing this as East and West. Versus collectivist. I don't even know which one she would be talking about as East versus West. Modern versus traditional. Yeah, I see that too. Modern versus traditional. These are used to describe Eastern countries versus Western countries. But I think the modern versus traditional thing is not necessarily used to describe the way people should act in a certain country. It's it's not a it's not a cause. It's more like an effect of the wealth of a country. I think the same people who would call a country modern would call that same country rich, developed. And I think the same people who would call that a country traditional would call that country un, uh, underdeveloped or developing, or third world or poor or whatever, right? Uh, or just in debt at this point. All, every single fucking country's in debt at this point. But um, <clears throat> I think they would look at these as the causes and the effect being the, the traditionalness and modernness of a country. So it's not like, it's, it's, it's not the root. I, I, think, I think most people would not view it as the root at least, which is really what we're talking about here. It's quite absurd to think that these very, very general terms can encapture a geographic half of the world. Watch, she's gonna talk about, sp uh, about statistics and stuff like that. And then she's gonna use very general terms to encapture, to encapture a geographic half of the world. Just watch, she's gonna do the same thing. In the 18th century. Because, you know, trends mean nothing, you know. Patterns mean nothing. If, if, like, it's... French philosophy. You can't have it both ways. Philosophy started to... You can't have it, oh, this culture has its distinct things, you know, somewhat distinct, and, you know, you got to understand that this culture is not the same as this culture. At the same time, you can't generalize on half the world. What? You can't have it both ways, bro. You can't say both those at the same time and not contradict yourself. To show more interest in areas like Persia, Arabic-speaking lands, and China which resulted in a counter movement that championed the East as superior. But Said points out that this seemingly positive counter movement is also caught in the problem of Orientalism because their interest in the East is determined by- Orientalism, bro. I'm learning so many new words. By their greater interest in the West, which is treated as the standard. This makes it so that the East cannot be thought of without the West, taking away its own independent nature as East Asia. I get that, but I also don't see all that much wrong with that, honestly. You can't necessarily think of the West as, as so modern and advanced without also thinking of the East. It developed, one of the strategies used to contest European imperial power was to participate in the West's Oriental narrative. It led to movements such as Pan-Asianism, which believed- Bro, uh, she's, she's saying so many vocab words, I can't keep up. I don't even know what the hell she just said. Believes in some commonality that distinguishes all of Asia from everyone else. In the early and mid 1900s, Japan used this idea of Pan-Asianism to promote and justify their imperial conquest. They claim to represent all of Asia. Just like how she's claiming to represent, um, what's it called? Actually, she's kind of contradicting herself. 
while on one hand she's she's claiming to represent Asians who, and even though she didn't outright say it, she's implying that she's representing Asians who feel a certain type of way, who are not native, like who, who didn't grow up in their native land, but moved somewhere else and things like that. She's claiming to represent these people and speaking for all of them. She's somehow making the case here that, uh, I don't know, maybe she might say this is a good thing that, that, uh, that Japan is trying to represent all of Asia. Once again, it's an individual thing. People are individuals. Speak for yourself. Japan convinced me. I, I know a lot of people that would be like, oh, but people, there's too many people and they're so complicated and there's so much depth in people. And, um, you know, you'd have to learn so much about each individual person to judge all of them. That's right. Don't judge all of them. Judge only who you feel like you can judge and who, who you know at that level. I don't cast judgment on anyone else unless I, well, I do. But I don't necessarily take it all that seriously and try to like, tell them how to live their life or tell them what they should do or, or, or anything like that with, um, with any sort of seriousness, unless I know them as, as well as I know, like the, my, the 10 people closest to me, you know, many Asian countries that their imperialist project was much more preferable to European imperialism. If anything, that's a solution. People think of it as like a moral imperative to speak on behalf of everyone else in the rest of the world. But ignore that for a second. Take it out of your mind that it's your moral imperative to do that, okay? That you have a duty to do that. Take that out of your mind. And just view it as a neutral thing for one second, okay? If you could only speak for those that you truly, truly know really, really well, then doesn't that solve all the solutions? Doesn't that solve all the problems? Doesn't that fix this whole thing about people going, oh, this culture is this and this and this and this. All, all the people, they, they want to cast judgment on judgment on judgment. They, they go like, oh, you can't say this word because you're not a part of this culture. And then they're like, well, I guess you grew up in this, in this culture. So I guess you can say the word. And I'm like, bro, are you going to, is how many times am I going to meet someone who's going to say the same exact thing? over and over and over again. Why don't people just accept, oh yeah, you have to know everyone on an individual level before you can actually judge what they should or should not do with their lives. It kind of solves the whole problem, doesn't it? When people stop viewing it as their, their, their moral duty to, to speak for other people that they don't know about. Doesn't that kind of fix things? But I guess that's not going to happen. I, I can talk about that much, much more in detail on why literally social media algorithms benefit when people want to speak on behalf of others. Because they were a part of the East. I don't think I need to talk about all the atrocities that came from Japanese imperialism, but let's just say that it did not unify Asia the way they claim. This is just one example of how Asia has participated in- Yeah, man. I'm thinking about it now. Japan used to go hard, bro. Look at them now. They're so soft. They like fell off. They got all these like hikikomoris and stuff like that. But like, they would go in. Constructing, reinforcing, and circulating the Orient ideology. It is an example of self-Orientalism, which I see as a type of self-fetishization. It continually happens with little- Okay. Self-Orientalism. You learn something new every day. I could see that. Sure. To see that as self-fetishization, that's a leap. You have to explain that to me, bro. Maybe I don't understand it, but you have to explain that to me. You have to walk me through the steps on how you get there. Criticism. And I think it's Maybe I'm maybe I I don't know the word fetish. Maybe I don't understand the definition of that all that well. Am I going to get banned for saying the word fetish so much? I don't think so. I know you can't say it on Roblox. Fetishization but, uh, is popularly thought of as someone fetishizing another. It convinces us that Asia themselves could never contribute to their own fetishization or oriental caricature. Who thinks that? I don't know anyone who's stupid enough to actually think that. I think the majority of people that I find who have any sort of common sense know that the majority of like fetishization, if you want to call it that, happens by people themselves, those same people. Like everyone, not just on a cultural level, but on an individual level. People want to 
take whatever they can get. They want to be proud of whatever they have. I was literally like, uh, I saw this fucking TikTok or whatever. I was scrolling through TikTok. I saw this fucking TikTok of like this dude, like uh, fucking criticizing this girl. And she was like, she was talking about like fucking like uh, how girls nowadays are like jealous of girls with small tits or whatever. She's like, even something that's considered a traditionally like, um, like a traditionally all throughout human history, I guess, like a not a desirable trait. She's like, hey, I'll take what I can get and I'll objectify and fetishize myself. I think most people with any sense can look around themselves and see the vast majority of objectification that happens in society happens by those same people complaining about it happening to them. But self-orientalism has played an important role in driving East Asia's soft power. What is soft power, you ask? Soft power is when you punch something really lightly while giggling like this. <laughs> So its impact is pretty soft and soft power. What was that editing, bro? Power is power in international relations acquired not through money or military. Oh my God, I know what she's talking about. Holy shit. What a strategy. What a strategy. Jeez, dude. That's intense. You think the like the the strategists, like the political strategists of these countries thought through all these steps and saw the force, like they had the foresight to see how it would turn out if they can make everyone fall in love with anime. You think they knew? That's crazy. Whoa, that would be a brilliant strategy for a country to like really, really take over. If they, if they, if they fetishize themselves, if they fetishize their own culture and they convince the rest of the world to do it too. Maybe weeaboos were all planned out. Maybe Japan knew a hundred years ago. They said, we're going to make this happen. Maybe. But through things like cultural exports and entertainment. Like I mentioned with Thai, Thailand, I mentioned that. Shaping the preferences of others to your advantage. Japan strongly focused on obtaining soft power to rebrand the nation no from doubt. being an imperialist power to, that had killed and conquered countless number of people to, to Nintendo, cool Japan. Nintendo Dragon kidding, Ball Z. They actually set up what's called the Council for the Promotion of Cool Japan in 2013. As a strategy to promote Council for the Promotion of Cool Japan in 2013. As a strategy to Council for the Promotion of Cool Japan. Ten years ago. Cool Japan strategy. Oh my god, I gotta check this out. Products to the world. The government worked to figure out what Japan's cultural DNA was. What was the Japanese aesthetic? Damn, these guys are nationalist as fuck. This is crazy. This is this is insane, dude. Like, don't worry about the, bro, change the whole identity of your entire country. Make it, like, in, not even recognizable from what it was before, from what you, you know, came to love it for. Just, just love the fact that it's your country and love the fact that it has the same name as the country that you were born in. And, uh, yeah, don't worry about what it is. Change it completely to where uh, you get the whole world to fall in love with it. Trick the whole world. Like, that's, that's insane. That's these guys went in, bro. These guys went in and they're still going in. One policymaker of the Japan brand project said that, quote, it is necessary to revisit Japan and consider how to properly discern Japanese cultural DNA and strategically standardize it. Discern. They did not discern it, bro. They're changing it. So as to successfully input it into Japanese products and services. But here's the thing, if you're properly representing a culture, then standardization shouldn't be possible. Culture- That was, that was an intelligent thing to say, kind of. Yeah. It's fluid, it's complex. Reducing a culture to one standardized aesthetic or- Okay, no, that's not so, you can reduce you can reduce culture to whatever the hell you want it to be, but it shouldn't be possible to to essentially have forces outside the culture manipulate that culture um, 
in a in a basically a corporate way to 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 sell attractions or whatever it should be a natural emergent property of the people and their social interactions and the the you know geology of the area and all that stuff it should be natural right that makes a lot more sense than what she's saying right now style is superficial right but Let's be honest, if the goal is to attract foreigners to your culture, then giving actual educational historical lessons is not going to sell. A consequence of cool Japan has been the- I think Japan did this better than any other country. I have, I have four, well, I guess I'm the fourth, but I have three friends who are like super diehard, like closest, closest friends. Um, and we always hang out together all the time. And these are my friends since childhood, since we were like little kids, elementary school level, and we're still friends to this day. These are the dudes. Three out of four of us consider the dream vacation Japan. We were thinking about it. We were like, we got to go out of the country. We're going out of the country sometime. Mm, actually, probably not in a while. We might go out of the country if we go on a cruise in the summer. But um, definitely end of the year around next year i would say we're going out of the country we got to go to india because uh what's it called phase has to like see some family members and things like that and then we want to go to like switzerland or whatever want to want to travel around a bit and these these conversations have been coming up and three out of the four of us not phase but the the remaining three of us me shauna and Zoe, all consider we ask each other like what's if you were to go to one place out of the country to visit where would it be japan all of us said that tokenization of indigenous traditional cultures and other minorities. However, when I think about it, I know Japan's not all that. Japan's not really all that. Japan is, it's, um, it's not all that easy to make that many friends there. Uh, it isn't nearly as beautiful as a lot of other places like in Europe and stuff like that. I mean, you, there's places in Japan that are absolutely stunning, but, um, people also don't speak very much English over there and things like that. It's, when, when you really look at it from a tourist perspective, it is just a, like a normal tourist attraction. Cultures. Their objects and practices have been occasionally included in promoting Japan, but only in so far as it's considered beneficial to the nation's image. Yeah, that motherfucker business insider always makes, you know, videos on like Japan's lost culture or whatever. They never talk about like the fact that like Japan overworks their people more than People, even people in the United States do. They never talk about the fact that like they have extremely high like suicidality, suicide rates as a result of, of this like overworking and stress and that uh, their students are in, in, people want to talk about the education system being corrupt in, in the United States and about it being inefficient and not teaching people things that are like worth learning. Bro, look at Japan's education system. Look, people learn Japanese quicker in the United States education system then they learn it in Japan because it's so old and so outdated and, and so poorly put together. People don't ever want to talk about the bad things about Japan. They only talk, want to talk about the good things of Japan. Socially and culturally marginalized voices that are not considered useful are paid little attention. Cultural diversity becomes promoted as a value that exists between different nations. Yeah, but it's a but is ignored as being within Japan. Nobody wants to talk about how many people are lonely as fuck in Japan, how they literally have a loneliness crisis at this point. How, how just how many people are dying, not even dying alone, dying versions. Nobody wants to talk about that. Itself. Now everyone knows that one of Japan's most successful cultural exports is anime. Hey yo. Don't talk too much about the misogyny and over-sexualization of girls in anime because I feel like that's widely known. I was about to say, yeah, it is, it is, people do talk about it a lot. Everyone talks about it. What I did find interesting was I that anime in directors such as Mamoru Oshii say that they deliberately de-Japanize, de-Japanize, de-Japanize? Both of those sound wrong. De-Japanize anime characters because anime is offering an alternative world. Japanize just sounds wrong. To the audience. I don't think, I think this is actually fairly innocuous. I don't think this is as bad as she's making it out to be. If I'm, if I'm making a movie, you know, about some historic thing, I gotta demodernize the movie, don't I? 
If, like in, in, in that movie that's about to come out, Oppenheimer, Chris Nolan movie, I'm pretty sure he has to demodernize. They're not going to put any modern cars in there and all that stuff right there. They're not going to put no electric cars in the movie and all that stuff. They got to demodernize the movie. I don't think this is actually all that bad. This is fairly innocuous. In fact, the whole, like the roots of anime, Astro Boy and whatnot, right? The roots of anime come from uh, families who were in love with Disney animation and in love with American animation. And they wanted to show their respect for America by like hand animating this kind of stuff. That's the roots of anime. Anime comes from a love of Western culture. So yeah, this, this seems fairly innocuous to me. If I'm, if I'm making a movie that takes place in, you know, in Europe, I'm not going to have no like, uh, uh, American like left hand drive cars in the countries that, that are, are like right hand drive right I'm not going to do all this I'm only mentioning cars this it's hard for me to I'm, my mind is on cars I've been looking at Miata videos and all this stuff but yeah um and that Quinex XCC 850 bro <sighs> what a what a new dream car unlocked oh man no I can't believe that that's the dream car now. That, that's it. That's it. I need like $10 million for it, but damn, that's the dream. Not stories taking place in Japanese society. I know a lot of them do. A lot of them are deeply in Japanese society, but a lot of them are not in Japanese society. It depends on the writer, depends on the story they're making. I'm not going to be like, man, uh, Chris Nolan, what's wrong with you? Why are you not talking about like modern things? Why are you looking at Oppenheimer, bro? Why are you making movies about things that happened so long ago? You're demodernizing, bro. You're de-Americanizing these movies. I'm not gonna like. That's like the word. Like that's like criticizing Django or whatever. You know. That's so, that's so un un modern day American. You know. That's why you have characters with unnatural hair and eye colors. I I don't think they they, a lot of these were done for um, to make it to make them look American. I think they're still intended to look Japanese even with their hair and eye colors. Well then, how does this lead to obsessive anime fans who wish they were born in Japan? Because they want to be like the anime characters and the anime characters are more like Japanese people. And, and view Japan as way cooler than America. <clears throat> Orientalism. Toshio Okada. Oh, an anime I guess I don't know what Orientalism is then. I, I, I really don't know. Producer and author explains that what grabs the Western audience's attention is the quote, Japanese way of life, which is embodied mm. in the mukokusike, racially, ethnically, and culturally unembedded imagery of animation. But since Japanese was that high I think that was high This is actively arranged. Man, what's wrong with me? How do I? How can I tell an anime just from that? From anime, then what obsessive anime fans really yearn for is an animated virtual Japan. Whoa. Okay, never mind. This doesn't apply to me anymore. It did for a second there, but yeah, no. Nah. I want to see real shit. I want to go. I want, bro. Really, I want to go to Japan, and just do karaoke with these guys. That's really what I want to do. Go do karaoke for a day, and then come back and be done with it. That's really all I want. Okada's. Are maybe that's his. Um, maybe that is the animated virtual Japan that he's talking about. Maybe I'm. Maybe it still applies to me actually. Maybe that's precisely what he means in sort of like a metaphorical sense, right? Argument at least serves to remind us that a sense of yearning for a particular country evoked through the consumption of cultural commodities is inevitably a monological illusion, since it is little concerned with the complexity of real culture. Ah, uh, I think you could say that about all cultural elements of a culture. Each individual element of a culture has little concern with the complexity of the real culture. Analyzing that piece of it can tell you a lot about the culture. The only reason she can even say this in the first place, or the guy who's saying this can even say this in the first place, is because they're able to analyze anime. Like, it's it's like a... If someone tells you... Um, if someone tells you, Oh, yeah, bro. Th uh, this, this, like almond coconut bar is terrible right that doesn't tell you about the real nature of the the 
the almonds or the real, the true nature of coconut, you know, or the real nature of that person. By analyzing what he said, you can start to understand a bit more about it. But that doesn't tell you the true nature of these things. That doesn't tell you whether or not you will like it or that you should be friends with that person or you will have the same taste as that person or if that person has allergies to that thing or if, you know, it, it's, it'll taste better to, to this person versus not that. It won't tell you anything about it. It won't tell you the nutritional facts about it. It won't tell you anything about the real complexity of the culture. But that's culture is made up of many, many, many different things that don't necessarily care about analyzing the, the culture as a whole, but are just emergent properties of that culture. It's people just having fun and living life and creating art. If I'm a painter, I'm not going to make every single one of my paintings try to, like, I'm not going to, you know, on the bottom of the painting, append a part to it and go, this painting says a lot about me and who I am as a person. And the way, no, I'm just going to create my paintings just because I'm compelled to do that. If someone were to analyze it, then they can come to these kinds of conclusions. And if anything, that's proof that it really does symbolize the, the complexity of the real culture. But like, why the hell would anyone care? Japan majorly influenced other East Asian countries to focus on their soft power as well. In this article about pop culture diplomacy in Japan, Koichi Iwabuchi calls it competing in a global beauty contest. South Korea is widely known for their successful cultural export. Which is really weird. Um, I don't know why J-pop hasn't taken off the way K-pop does. I was just thinking about that actually. Their music industry, fashion and beauty industry, film and media, food. Oh yeah, now they're really big in films. Are all extremely popular here. I never go to Japanese barbecue places. There's this place called like Gyukaku or whatever. They have like great steaks. Um, but it's like super sweet. I'm not a big fan of like the really, really sweet steak. I like savory, you know? I like a lot of, I like, like thick, um, not thick. Like I like a rock salt, you know, non-homogenous, um, that sort of thing, you know? But yeah, there's way more Korean barbecue places than Japanese barbecue places, for sure. In the West. And I just want to talk a little more specifically about K-pop since I listen to K-pop. Damn, you really got to spend more money to cook your own food, huh? That's crazy. And she listens to K-pop. And why am I not surprised? And I know that the South Korean government wasn't originally a huge funder of the industry, but they certainly are pushing it now. The K-pop entertainment company is have are, are have a monopoly, and they're they're all industry plants. They're only pushing industry plants. Been trying to tap into the American market for a long time now, and their efforts have really ramped up in the past few years. Ever since BTS kind of broke that barrier. More and more K-pop groups have English. That's an interesting thing to talk about too. That's something I, I would want to dive deeper into because music industry stuff, right? What did they tap into? Why are so many American girls so like, like, uh, you know, like giddy, like, you know, you've seen those videos of like girls like chasing after Justin Bieber and shit. They're like, oh my God. Why are they so like that for these like, completely emasculated carbon copy dudes one after another that you can literally just go like copy paste copy paste copy paste that are like hardly even dudes they're like hardly even actual human beings at this point they're straight up like robots why are these girls so infatuated with them that's something i think i'd want to dive deeper into that's interesting English speaking members release english versions of songs and try to win american awards and titles Damn. I hear a lot of Korean people and East Asians in general saying that they are so glad to have K-pop spreading Korean culture across the world. BTS received the Hwagwon Order of Cultural Merit from the South Korean government, which reinforces the idea that K-pop is a reliable image of South Korean culture. Yet at the same time, K-pop idols are treated as commodities that need to be polished and presented as consumable to fans. They are trained to perfection. Yeah, this is the complete antithesis. I don't know why if you ever truly respected your culture, you would push for something like this. I don't know why you would push for someone to, to take your culture and commodify it and make it as palatable as possible to other people 
that are not part of the culture just so that they can, you know, make a quick buck. I don't know why you would value someone who's not being authentic to that culture. And in, and also in that way, I don't know why people who who listen to K-pop would, you know, in some way develop some sort of a respect for Korea because they could see through the bullshit and realize these people are made to be as such. They're made like in factories at this point, bro. And they are prohibited from dating so that we feel they belong to us. They are all held to one single beauty standard so that many will have to get plastic surgery to look a certain way. There's literally a standardization of product. And just as how the Japanese- Yeah, that's not a natural evolution of a culture. That's a, a company or a government saying, we don't really care about our culture's evolution and the game that the culture plays as an emergent property of its people. We're not going to let it evolve naturally. We're going to take it, conform it into this box, and sell it to the rest of the world and say, this is our culture. If anything, that's the most disrespectful thing you can do to your culture. Japanese government tried to instill the Japanese DNA into their cultural exports. Korea did the same. It's a strategy of getting foreigners to become interested in... A lot of anime, though, was started not because big companies wanted to make hella money by shaping the, the Japanese culture or whatever, reshaping it to, to fit a more palatable environment to Westerners. It was actually because certain families who didn't even have all that much, who just loved hand drawing, basically, certain families who also loved Walt Disney and loved American culture, wanted Japanese people to see the greatness in that animation culture. So I think it's a bit different. But nowadays, because of what anime has evolved into and because of all the animation houses in China and all this stuff, it's definitely, it's definitely not what it used to be. One thing, say K-dramas, but then lure them down the Korean wave pipeline and become obsessed with K-pop, K-beauty, and Korean food as well. I know a lot of K-pop fans say the funnel. Well, Western celebrities have to have a good public image and look perfect. Sometimes. Too. Which is true, but you gotta admit that it is super rare to find celebrities like Lil Nas X. That's the worst example. Lil Nas X is one of these people who, who are, are basically doing the exact same thing. They're basically in, in, they've stepped on the assembly lines of many different facets of the culture for sure. But they're taking this and they're commodifying it, not just for the States, but for the rest of the world. Like, um, like, bro, I've heard from people that he's not even actually gay, that he just says this just to get more clout. I've heard from people in Atlanta, which is where he was born. I've heard from people like music blog people, like people who are big in the industry, people who do like big time interviews. I've heard from these people. He's literally not even gay. So yeah, um, Lil Nas X is the worst example. I don't know what kind of music she listens to, but there's way better examples of, of people who are truly independent artists who don't necessarily care about taking the culture and, you know, making it conform to something so that they can appeal to the rest of the world, but rather taking their culture and trying to spread it to the people around them and they blow up, you know, like tons of people in the rap industry do that. Doja Cat or Lizzo who don't act like perfect cool. No, they, 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 they do. They do in the same sort of sense. They act like what people want them to act like. In the same way that, uh, that people are emasculated and allowed to be weak in, in these places, they're not incentivized to, to make themselves stronger and to view you know, the stronger people as, as good role models. In the same way, they take people with little self-control like Doja Cat, who, who make promises and then don't keep them and don't get very many sales actually in the grand scheme of things. Or they take people like Lizzo who just let themselves go and who, you know, the public can be like, oh, I can relate to that. I can relate to have no self, I can relate to having no self-control. And I want to live vicariously through someone just like me who has no self-control, who doesn't want to better themselves, but gets all of the money and fame and everything anyways, because you know, that makes me feel good. And I want that kind of life where I don't actually work for my success. And they take people like, it's the same thing. It's literally the same thing. So these are bad examples that she's giving. 
I don't know if she like listens to the kind of music where it has truly independent artists and not industry plants like Doja Cat and Lizzo. And mm, Lil Nas X is not an industry plant. He sort of planted himself in the industry. But um, people who are very, very meticulous and very methodical about their strategy to make it rather than actually just wanting to create art and it just happens to spread. Cool K-pop idols on their TikTok accounts. The PS5, tell me. Yeah, but that's the whole thing. Like that's the same sort of same sort of thing. People look at Lizzo as perfect, even though she's clearly not in the same way that these people are clearly not perfect because that's what they want to be perfect. That's what they've been convinced by people in control of the culture that this is with a perfect image. That, oh, this is the new body image, bro. It's okay to be, it's a plus size, bro. It's plus size. Everyone's perfect. Everyone, no matter what your size, you're always perfect. It's the same thing. Why you make me decide? I can't Please watch this. I, yeah, and this the same thing. It's actually the same thing. This is just as like gross and painful. I don't know if she feels differently. That's the thing. She might feel differently. She might look at this and be like, yeah, this guy's beautiful. But I don't see that. I see this as gross. I see this as someone like modifying their body and, and everything about them and their face and everything and poking holes in their ears and, you know, completely fucking up their hair and doing all this shit. I see someone who like fucked up their life, who looks like a, a mannequin, who looks like their soul is gone. Like, that's what I see. And then I see the same sort of thing here. The same sort of thing. Someone just ugly, gross, like whether or not they, they, they appeal to a different sort of meta in, in the music industry is kind of irrelevant. There, it's the same sort of strategy. Like this is what people have to accept now. It, that's the message behind it. Oh, I actually do cuss a little. Do you? <laughs> also, What's yeah. Your right yeah, Lizzo's just as gross as those, those K-pop artists who just basically get plastic surgery. With each other the way Kanye and Pete have. The K-pop industry fetishizes their own idols so that us fans all the way over here are already consuming fetishized versions of Korean people. This is not me scolding Oof. anyone for listening to K-pop because then I'd just be a complete hypocrite. Oh no, I'd scold people for listening to K-pop. I would. I just want to acknowledge that there is a tension between praising K-pop as a good representation of Korean culture and the way they commodify its people. Just as an added safety measure in case there are any mad K-popies out there, here. I have a photo card of Jungkook. Oh, this girl is this girl is pathetic. This girl is pathetic. Wow. Never mind. Okay, let's see what does she ask this what does she have to say? Tourism. Cool. They want more tourism. Um, empowerment and self-fetishization. I know she's going to have some stupid takes over there. Um, let's just go to her outro. That was gross. I don't want to see that, bro. The West, at the end of the day... I don't know why you feel the need to appeal to these stupid-ass people who might criticize you in the comments. If anything, disrespect them. See what happens. See if that changes your opinion on things. Be like, damn, maybe I shouldn't be a part of this culture if they're going to go this hard on someone who points out something totally reasonable. I think self-fetishization is the most dangerous and pressing matter. What a useful video essay. God damn, dude. Um, our conception of love is messed up. Tragically beautiful art. Romanticizing men mental illness. This video is going to have some bad takes. Um, because, again, romanticizing. Again, it's all these words. A lot of art can and I think should and definitely does successfully represent mental illness, especially by the people who, who make that art, people who, who wrote, who composed great works of music, who composed great, great, great works of classical music and then committed suicide afterwards. And you listen to that music without even knowing that they did so. I learned about later on that they did so. And I'm like, damn, this is the most beautiful, but like gut-wrenching piece of music ever. Or people who would like these like schizophrenic, paranoid, uh, depressed people who would make video games about their own personal experiences. And also all the paintings as well of people with mental illness. There's a lot of greatness in like tragically beautiful art. Uh... From SJW to conservative. She had a phase. I think a lot of people have that phase. 
um, what makes Gen Z humor so interesting? Interesting is a, you're giving it a lot of credit. Um, is it an outfit or is he just, or is he just a man? What? Okay. Stop denying the women their autonomy. You need a job.